Now, unfortunately, you've got to make another choice. Okay? Everybody in the room has to make these choices. And that choice determines what is your business model going to be. And so I'm going to walk through and talk a little bit about the four choices that you have, or I have. Okay? And remember, what we're going to try to do the whole time is we're trying to simplify what's complicated. And the idea uh, of simplification is once you've simplified it, simplify it again, simplify it again, simplify it again. So over a period of time, it's continuous refinement and refinement and refinement. I thought this is pretty cool because um, if you look at this, this was the blueprint for the 1903 flyer that you saw. They actually made a plan and made a blueprint before they built it. What a concept, okay? So a business model is a blueprint. It's a blueprint for the key elements and strategies that you're going to organize together through systems, processes, technology, and people to produce a specific result. Now, we have many new kinds of business models that are being developed in the world that we're in because technology enables us to do things we never were able to do. The internet has changed the game of how people buy, how people learn, how, pe how people market. It's changed the game and it's changing the game at many iterations faster and faster than it ever has. The culture is changing. The buy it, buying habits are changing. Okay? So, you develop a model, some models are dying, right? New models are being born, right? Some, some people are trying to extend models, like they did with the Sony Walkman, keep the Kaizening it, making it better and better, until the iPod came out, and it literally wiped the Walkman off the face of the earth, okay? It literally bankrupted Sony. Sony's still out there, but they continue to lose money. They've never found their feet, okay? New models antiquate old models. Okay? Pay attention to me. New models antiquate old models. Okay? You know when a model is dying, pay attention, because it becomes a commodity. And everybody, whether they're financial planners, whether they're accountants, whether they're attorneys, lawyers, I don't care, everybody is trying to get out of the commodity business. But because the commodity business is a buy and price alone business. And nobody that's in a service business can afford to stay in business on a price only, a low provider business. You can do it in the manufacturing, but it's very difficult to do it in a, a service oriented business. So keep this in mind about a model, because now we're going to build a model. We're going to build it, right? Right as we're sitting here. A model has to be simple. It has to be relevant. It has to be understandable and it's easy to implement. Easy to implement. Okay? Now, again, let's remind ourselves that different models are designed for different results, right? These two animals aren't designed to behave the same, to act the same. They don't even eat the same. They don't even get their prey the same. Okay? So we have to remember that different models are designed. Even in athletics, you have a distance runner's body is totally different than a sprinter's body. This guy is going for 100 yards. And if you've watched them, they blast out of there with so much energy, it's frightening. But they only go 100 yards and they're done. Okay? So you have, to, you have to kind of decide, you're in this, you're running a marathon. You're in practice 20, 30, 40 plus years, right? You're running a marathon. You're not a sprinter, right? Yes, no? So you have to think about, well, how can I sustain myself? How do I find the balance? Because every one of you know, once you get to be 40, you got less energy than when you were 30. Once you get to be 50, you got less energy. You can't do the same stuff. You don't even want to do it anymore. Okay? So design it for the long term, right? The best thing that happened to me in my life not the best thing, but one of the better things that happened, certainly not the best, was when I went into the hospital, I came out of the hospital, I said, I'm never working more than three clinical days a week. I'm never doing dentistry more than three days a week. If I can't make a living doing three days a week, and I didn't really fully comprehend that what I was doing right there is 80-20. I can't work with everybody. 
I had to really be and working three days a week. I was able to reach financial independence by the time I was 37. Okay? I was able to provide for my children's all education and educated their mother as well, five women. Okay? And I was able to come out and start the center. Okay? So, you know, I, I think it's really important to get in the right model, right? Because if you're in the wrong model, you're just going to work hard, and you're going to work hard, and you're going to work harder. Okay? So you need to design your practice for the long term, not for the short term. Okay? So this is a short term practice. Okay? This is model, this is level one, which is a far, like a pharmacy. And this is uh, David Meister's iteration of models. It's about transactions. No relationship is wanted or needed. Okay? Let me fix you. Come here, let's single tooth dentistry. There's no interest in the cause of the disease. All we're interested in doing is fixing you. Okay? Okay? And this represents about 65% of the dentists in the United States. 65% yeah. is our best estimate. Now, a lot of dentists think they're level two, but they're really level one. So let's talk about level one, level two. See? So the idea behind the pharmacy is, look, I know what my problem is. I got a headache. Um, I'm coming to get some aspirin. Don't tell me about anything else that's going on. Does that ring a bell to anybody that's in practice about patients? Just fix my teeth. Just clean my teeth. That's all I need. Just clean. Yeah, just go ahead. We'll just go ahead and get the bacteria in your bloodstream. It doesn't make any difference to what your, what your health is. We'll just clean your teeth. Right? But it, it doesn't that represent a big percentage of what happens in our world? Okay? Transaction-based. Okay? And it's, it's easy, it's simple, still no relationship. Get them in and get them out. Needs, you need many patients. This is still the pharmacy. And patients don't stick around. That's why you need 100 new patients a month, because they, they leave. They don't stay around. The idea isn't to form relationships with people. The idea is to use them. Okay? Sell them something, get them out. Sell them something, get them out. Now, there's another level, and that's the level two. Okay? Now, the difference between a level one and level two is the level two dentist generally has more advanced training. Okay. This is all specialists are included in this group, by the way. Okay. More advanced training. Now they know more, so now they got a bigger hammer. That the idea is I got a bigger hammer and they look at everybody as a nail. So now they're, they're, they're going to do is they're going to try to sell them. They, they need a relationship, they need more of a relationship, but they need just enough relationship to sell them the dentistry. Okay. They don't really need to care about them deeply, they just need to... Now, that represents 30% of the dentists in the country. That's a big percentage. Because, you know, continuing education, advanced continuing ed education, is available to all of us much more than it used to be. So we, you really go from level one to level two with advanced technical training. Okay. It's a transition. I want you to pay attention. This is really important. It's not a transformation. The practices are different. Uh, the, the level two dentists are selling bigger pieces to people, whereas a level one dentist, the average new patient is 900 to 1100. The level two is someplace around, oh, 2500 to 3000. Okay? So they're, 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 patients are buying more dentistry. But the level three is totally different. The level three is a whole different model. Doesn't even look like, act like, talk like, a level two or one. But unfortunately, for the public's sake, there's only about three to four percent of those dentists in the country. And I'm being very kind with this percentage. Okay? They are patient-centered, patient-centered, not procedure-centered, not doctor-centered. Do you get the difference here? Patient-centered, not procedure-centered, not doctor-centered. They're systems-based. They're looking at the whole system the periodontium, the teeth, the joints, the muscles. They're bringing into consideration the overall health of the patient rather than just the health of the teeth or joints or, or periodontium. And a different kind of relationship is established. More of a partnering, more of a collaboration, more of an interdependent sort of relationship. I like to refer to it as coaching. Remember, you can't coach anybody that doesn't have a goal. 
You can't coach anybody that doesn't want to get better. You with me? So in the world of dentistry, it's, it's moving more towards health. What would an ideal health situation be like? Maybe in the world that I live in, it also the world of, of working with dentists and their practices, it's the world of getting better. Follow me? Anybody that, if you don't want to get better, you can't coach them, right? It's like an athlete. You can't coach an athlete that doesn't. Is this making sense? Level one, level two are more alike. Level three is distinctly different. It's marketed different. There's a different kind of people in it. There's different kind of procedures. The size of the office is different. The environment is different. Doesn't even look like a level one or two. So <clears throat> there's more co-discovery, co-diagnosis and treatment planning. As I mentioned earlier, independent patients. You, you can only coach people when they have a goal. You can only coach people when they have a goal, okay? So the brain surgeon then, the brain surgeon is, and, and I always remember and reflect on having my back surgery in 1997 down at the Barrows. I try to get everybody that ever has back surgery to go to Barrows uh, because they've got some, a couple of the finest neurosurgeons in the world down there, and I was blessed to have Carl Sontag. But I remember it was just like this. Carl Sontag would walk in and his residents would walk behind him. And you know, when Sontag would walk in the room, everybody would genuflect and he would speak in German and he was like, he's like God, you know. And, and then when I finished the surgery, the, sec the, the second day he came in and I got out of bed and he walked around and the residents were with him and they were genuflecting. And it, it was God had done a surgery. And I was happy because I did have God do my surgery. But I never heard from him before or never heard from him since. See, so the people that are brain surgeons in dentistry are the people that lead their technical continuing places. And 90% of their patients are their what? Their students. Right? So when people go to them, they kind of genuflect when they walk in the room and then they have their work done. Okay? Now, this is interesting because these people are dealing with patients that have, so to speak, life-altering problems. I really didn't care if I had a relationship with Carl Sontag, I just wanted to be able to walk and be able to play golf after the surgery, you know. So it's kind of, they don't, they, they again are not into relationships. See, I think the happy spot, this is just me, I think the happy spot is level three. Now, uh, there are a lot of dentists that think they're level three, but they're twos, right? They're low twos, they're medium twos, but they're very few true level three dentists. A couple of them happen to be in this room right now, but there are very few of them. Okay? So here's the dilemma, for, and we've got some residents in the room, we've got some young people in the room. You've got some serious dilemmas, okay? And so do dentists that aren't constantly trying to get, improve themselves and get better. So I want to share this dilemma with you. There's less and less demand for level one and two. Why? Because there's greater competition. And because they're greater number of providers. Everybody's doing it. If 95% of the people are in, 95% of dentists are in these models, they are competing with each other, right? And there's greater numbers of types of providers, okay? Well, what that leads to is the demand for le less demand, lower fees, and the need for greater volume. The lower your fees, the more the volume. Makes sense, doesn't it? Lower fees, greater volume. Lower fees, greater volume. Which leads to impersonalized care, inferior care, disenchanted patients. This is a negative spiral going nowhere. Spending less time with people leads to people accepting less treatment, leads to people accepting incomplete treatment, leads to disease care. Okay? Spending more time with treat people, trying to help them understand what the problem is, trying to help them understand what's going on, making them aware creating tension with them, right? Looking at what they really want, and we're gonna talk about that, helps people move towards treatment. Okay? But if you don't spend the time with, and not yakking at patients doesn't do this. Just talking to people about what they should do is not what I'm talking about. It leads to collection problems, it leads to rapid patient turnover, it leads to dental legal problems, it leads to the dentist as a money-grabbing entrepreneur, and it leads to no intrinsic rewards for the dentist.
Very few intrinsic rewards are in a level one and level two practice. The intrinsic rewards are in the level threes and can't even be in fours. So what this is based on, and when you think about this, these are kind of like emotional states. You know, total disability is a feeling state and a disabling. People really don't accomplish very much when they're emotionally disabled. They make very bad decisions, okay? And then there's the enabling and then there's the frank power state. So I want to run through this with you because I got this from my wife Patty, who ha who's happens to be here today, kind of watching, observing. Um, Patty is a gospel singer, so it would make sense that something like this would come from Patty. So the, again, the issue of a choice as to how we're going to live. Are we going to live out of fear below the line? Now let's watch how this goes. Number one is we evaluate or judge people, which automatically puts us at an energy level of 175, which is nothing happens when anybody's energy is below 200. Nothing happens but bad stuff, okay? Now watch this, watch how this works. I'm gonna evaluate you, now I have some suspicion, not sure about you. And now my energy's at 150, and whenever you get to a distrust relationship with a patient or a staff member, the game is over, done. Doubt, okay, people are at 100. They're at doubt, they're indecision, they're procrastinating. So you see why I said they're not going anywhere? People that are in doubt, they're in indecision and procrastination aren't going anywhere. Then that leads to the next level. By the way, this isn't going to getting better, is it, right? Leads to greed. I need to get more from you. That's 75. You ever been around somebody like that? You're in trouble, okay? Which leads to jealousy, I'm hanging on to what I've got which leads to hostility, prolonged anger. It's one thing to get angry. It's another thing to be around somebody that has prolonged anger. Prolonged anger. They just can't get over it, right? Can you, can you think, anybody think about it like that? They can't get over it, okay? Which leads to withdrawal. Now the withdrawal is active, that is they leave, or it's passive aggressive. They're gonna stay with you, they're just gonna kick the behoovers out of you every time they're around you. That's passive aggressive behavior. Do you see where that energy level is? Okay, it's down around 30. And this is when, this is when people check out. You know what I mean by check out? They end the game. When their energy gets to so low, there is absolutely no hope. So there's a whole lot of people that are living like this. So it starts with judging others. On the other hand, we can move up. When we begin to recognize people, just recognize them. Just recognize them. I mean, just, oh, you're there. Oh, oh, it isn't just about me. Oh, 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 there is another person in the world other than me, okay? And we can accept someone even though we don't necessarily approve of them, okay? In other words, you can accept somebody's behavior. See, see, the acceptance of someone is really important to forming a relationship with people. And we might not agree with everything they do, but we can accept them. And that can lead to appreciate, well, holy cow, they really think differently than I do, but I can appreciate them. Now, see, really good things in people's lives happen when the energy level goes up. Really bad things happen in people's lives when energy level goes down. Okay? The key is energy. The key is energy. The key to growth is energy. I wish I could put energy across the room. If, if the energy is positive and is 250, 300 or higher, you are going to grow. But if energy is below the line, you are not going to grow. I don't care what, you cannot grow. You will resist growth your whole life. Okay? You're just going to make it difficult. The next level is respect. Okay? okay, I recognize you, I accept you, I appreciate you, I respect you. Wow, what a concept, respecting somebody. Holy cow. 
Wow. Now, I think, this is my take on this, I think respect comes before trust. I was doing a seminar similar to this, but not being recorded, in Michigan years and years ago. And one of my students, uh, a guy that was, he wasn't a student yet, but he was becoming a student, he said, Mike, I have, I have employed five associates and I haven't kept any. He said, but you said something to me a while ago that made so much sense and I have the first working associate that's going to become a partner. You said never hire anybody you don't respect. Because if you don't respect someone, ultimately you won't trust them. Right? And you, you see how this could go up or down, follow me? And so I think it's really important that we think about we need to, we need to work with people this is both ways. I mean, you know, if, people, if you're looking to work for somebody else, it, it should be somebody that you respect, okay? And trust leads to honor, and honor leads to admiration. And eventually, the issue is, if any of us could get here, I don't think our culture is really built for this. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't think it's really built for it. But you know what I've experienced, and, and I, I say this to people that know me and, and know about uh, my wife, Patty, and I bring this up in public because you know, she resonates at a much higher level of energy than I do. She's an amazing, amazing person. And what she does is she pulls you up. Just like people that have low energy pull us what? Down. So the old adage is hang around people that have got a lot of the good energy. I love Jim Rohn's statement. You'll never be any better than the five people you spend the most time with. I love that. You hang out with the turkeys, you're going to become a turkey. You know. You hang out with the eagles and they're going to pull you up. So let me say this, that structure, not your intention, determines the kind of model you're going to get. You could intend to have this, but my dad used to say, the prison is filled with people with good intentions. And then he used to quote, the road to hell is filled with people with good intentions. So it's up to you to make that choice. Uh, level one is piecework, level two is mechanical, level three is health centered, and level four is the expert model. You got to choose. Here's the problem. It's a big problem. Most of us start out at level one. I know I did, right? You know, Tim, uh, it's really interesting because when I left Dyersville, he saw a lot of my patients and he, and he actually saw the work that was done in, 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 the, in the relationships. And, and I was in Chicago one time. And I don't think it, I saw you, but I was somebody in Chicago. And I was sitting at a booth, and somebody else was seeing my patients around Dyersville. And they came up to me, and they said, I don't know, how did you get all that dentistry in those people's mouths? Was that you that said me. It was you. We were at the booth at PEP. That was you. And do you remember what I said? I said, I just loved them. I just took care of them. Just, just did the best I could to take care of them. And they felt that. And they knew that. 